Chapter Twenty Three of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter Twenty Three. Hugo had no friends. One single individual whom he loved, whom he could have taken fully into his confidence, might in a measure have resolved his whole life. Yet so intense was the pressure that had conditioned him that he invariably retreated before the rare opportunities for such confidences. He had known many persons well, his father and mother, Anna Blake, Lefty Forsman, Charlotte, Iris, Tom Shane, Roseanne, even Skorsky, but none of them had known him. His friendliness was responsible for a melancholy yearning to remain with his kind. Having already determined to go away, he sought for a kind of compromise. He did not want to be in New York or Washington or any other city. The landscape of America was haunted for him. He would leave it. But he would not open himself to the cruel longings for his own language, the sight of familiar customs and manners. From his hotel in New York he made excursions to various steamship agencies and travel bureaus. He had seen many lands, and his wanderlust demanded novelty. For days he was undecided. It was a chance group of photographs in a Sunday newspaper that excited his first real interest. One of the pictures was of a man, erect, white-haired, tanned, clear-eyed, Professor Daniel Hardin, a procession of letters, head of a new expedition to Yucatan. The other pictures were of ruined temples, unpiled stone causeways, jungle. He thought instantly that he would like to attach himself to the party. Many factors combined to make the withdrawal offered by an expedition ideal. The more Hugo thought about it, the more excited he became. The very nascency of a fresh objective was accompanied by and crowded with new hints for himself and his problems. The expedition would take him away from his tribulations, and it would not entirely cut him off from his own kind. Professor Hardin had both the face and the fame of a distinguished man. A thought that had been in the archives of his mind for many months came sharply into relief. Of all human beings alive, the scientists were the only ones who retained imagination, ideals, and a sincere interest in the larger world. It was to them that he should give his allegiance, not to the statesmen, not to industry or commerce or war. Hugo felt that in one quick glimpse he had made a long step forward. Another concept, far more fantastic, and in a way even more intriguing, dawned in his mind, as he read accounts of the Maya ruins which were to be excavated. The world was cluttered with these great lumps of incredible architecture. Walls had been builded by primitive man, temples, hanging gardens, obelisks, pyramids, palaces, bridges, terraces, roads, all of them gigantic and all of them defying the penetration of archaeology to find the manner of their creation. Was it not possible, Hugo's heart skipped a beat when it occurred to him, that in their strange combination of ignorance and brilliance the ancients had stumbled upon the secret of human strength? His secret? Had not these antique and migratory peoples carried with them the formula which could be poured into the veins of slaves, making them stronger than engines? And was it not conceivable that as their civilizations crumbled, the secret was lost, together with so many other formula of knowledge? He could imagine plumed and painted priests with prayer and sacrifice, cutting open the veins of prehistoric mothers and pouring in the magic potion. When the babies grew, they could raise up the pyramids, walls, and temples. They could do it rapidly and easily. A great enigma was thus resolved. He set out immediately to locate Professor Hardin, and with difficulty arranged an interview with him. Preparations for the expedition were being carried on in an ordinary New York business office. A secretary announced Hugo, and he was conducted before the professor. Daniel Hardin was no dusty pedagogue. His knowledge was profound and academic. His books were authoritative. 
but in himself he belonged to the type of man certain to succeed, whatever his choice of occupation. Much of his life had been spent in field work, arduous toil in bizarre lands where life depended sometimes on tact and sometimes on military strategy. He appraised Hugo shrewdly before he spoke. What can I do for you, Mr. Danner? Hugo came directly to the point. I should like to join your Yucatan expedition. Professor Hardin smiled. I'm sorry we're full up. I'll be glad to go in any capacity. Have you any special qualifications? Knowledge of the language, of archaeology? No. The professor picked up a tray of letters. These letters, more than three hundred, are all from young men and women who would like to join my expedition. I think I should be useful, Hugo said, and then he played his trump, and I should be willing to contribute for the favor of being included a sum of fifty thousand dollars. Professor Hardin whistled, and then his eyes narrowed. What's your object, young man? Treasure? No, a life, let us say, with ample means at my disposal and no definite purpose. Boredom, then, he smiled. A lot of these other young men are independently wealthy and bored. I must say I feel sorry for your generation. But no, I can't accept. We're already adequately financed. Hugo smiled in response. Then perhaps I could organize my own party and camp near you. That would hamper me. Then a hundred thousand dollars. Good Lord, you are determined. I have decided. I'm familiar with the jungle. I'm an athlete. I speak a little Spanish, enough to boss a labor gang. I propose to assist you in that way as well as financially. I'll make any contract with you that you desire and attach no strings whatever to my money. Professor Hardin pondered for a long time. His eyes twinkled when he replied, You won't believe it, but I don't give a damn for your money. Not that it wouldn't assist us. But the fact is, I could use a man like you. Anybody could. I'll take you. And you can keep your money. There'll be a check in the mail tomorrow, Hugo answered. The professor stood. We're hoping to get away in three weeks. You'll leave your address with my secretary, and I'll send a list of the things you'll want for your kit. He held out his hand, and Hugo shook it. When he had gone, the professor looked over the rooftops and swore gleefully to himself. Hugo discovered after the ship sailed that everyone called Professor Hardin Dan and they used Hugo's first name from the second day out. Dan Harden was too busy to be very friendly with any of the members of his party during the voyage, but they themselves fraternized continually. There were deck games and card games. There were long and erudite arguments about the people whom they were going to study. What was the Mayan time cycle, and did it correspond to the Egyptian Sothic cycle or the Greek Metonic cycle, and where did the Mayans get their jade? Did they come from Asia, over Bering Strait, or were they a colony of Atlantis? When they knew so much about engineering, why did they not use the keystone arch and the wheel? Why was their civilization decadent, finished when the conquistadors discovered it? How old were they? Four thousand years or twelve thousand years? There were innumerable other debates to which Hugo listened like a man newborn. The cold Atlantic winds were transformed overnight to the balm of the Gulf Stream. Presently they passed the West Indies, which lay on the water like marine jewels. Ages turned back through the days of buccaneering to the more remote times. In the port of Xantal, a rickety wharf, a single white man, a zinc bar, and a storehouse filled with chickle blocks marked off the realm of the twentieth century. The ship anchored. During the next year it would make two voyages back to the homeland for supplies, but the explorers would not emerge from the jungle in that time. An antiquated wood-burning locomotive, which rocked along over treacherous rails, carried them inland. The scientists became silent and pensive. In another car the Maya Indians, who were to do the manual labor, chattered incessantly in their explosive tongue. At the last sun-baked stopped, they disembarked slept through an insect droning night and entered the jungle for three weeks they hacked and hewed their way forward the vegetation closed behind them cutting off the universe as completely as the submerging waves of the sea it was hot difficult work 
to which Hugo lent himself with an energy that astounded even Hardin, who had judged him valuable. One day, when the high mountains loomed into view, Hugo caught his first glimpse of a total, the sacred city. A creeper on the hillside fell before his machete, then another, a hole in the green wall, and there it stood, shining white, huge, desolate, still as the grave. His arm hung in mid-air. Over him passed the mystic feeling of familiarity, that fugitive sense of recognition which springs so readily into a belief in immortality. It seemed to him during that staggering instant that he knew every contour of those great structures, that he had run in the streets, lived, loved, and died there, that he could almost remember the names and faces of its inhabitants, dead for thousands of years that he could nearly recall the language and the music that destiny itself had arranged a homecoming. The vision died. He gave a great shout. The others rushed to his side and found him trembling and pointing. Tons of verdure were cut down and pushed aside. A hacienda was constructed and a camp for the laborers. Then the shovels and picks were broken from their boxes, the scientists arranged their paraphernalia, and the work began, interrupted frequently by the exultant shouts that marked a new finding. No one regretted Hugo. He made his men work magically. His example was a challenge. He could do more than any of them, and his hair and eyes, black as their own, his granite face, stern and indefatigable, gave him a natural dominion over them. All this, the dark, starlit, plushy nights, with their hypnotic silences, the vivid days of toil, the patient and single-minded men, was respite to Hugo. It salved his tribulations. It brought him to a gradual assurance that any work with such men would be sufficient for him. He was going backward into the world instead of forward, and that did not matter. He stood on the frontier of human knowledge. He was a factor in its preparation, and if what they carried back with them was no more than history, if it cast no new light on existing wants and perplexities, it still served a splendid purpose. Months rolled by unheeded. Hugo gathered friends among these men, and the greatest of those friends was Daniel Hardin. In their isolation and occasional loneliness, each of them, little by little, stripped his past for the others. Only Hugo remained silent about himself until his reticence was conspicuous. He might never have spoken except for the accident. It was in itself a little thing which happened apart from the main field of activity. Hugo and two Indians were at work on a small temple at the city's fringe. Hardin came down to see. The great stone in the roof, crumbled by ages, slipped and teetered. Underneath the professor stood unheeding. But Hugo saw. He caught the mass of rock in his arms and lifted it to one side, and Dan Hardin turned in time to perceive the full miracle. When Hugo lifted his head he knew, and yet to his astonishment there was no look of fear in Hardin's blue eyes. Instead, they were moderately surprised and vastly interested. He did not speak for some time, and then he said, Thanks, Danner. I believe you saved my life. Should you mind picking up that rock again? Hugo dismissed the Indians with a few words. He glanced again at Hardin to make sure of his composure, and then he lifted the square stone back to its position. Hardin was thinking aloud. That stone must weigh four tons. No man alive can handle four tons like that. How do you do it, Hugo? Hot, streaming sun, tumbled debris. This profound question asked again, asked mildly for the first time. My father was a biologist, a great biologist. I was an experiment. Good Lord, and that's why you've kept your past dark, Hugo. Of course, not many people survive the shock. You forget that we here are all scientists. I won't press you. Perhaps Hugo heard himself saying, I'd like to tell you. In that case, in my room tonight, I should like to hear. That night, after a day of indecision, Hugo sat in a dim light and poured out the story of his life. Hardin never interrupted, never commented, until the end. And then he said softly, 
You poor devil! Oh, you poor bastard! And Hugo saw that he was weeping. He tried to laugh. It isn't as bad as that, Dan. Son, his voice choked with emotion, this thing, this is my life work. This is why you came to my office last winter. This is the most important thing on earth. What a story! What a man you are! On the contrary, don't be modest. I know, I feel, I understand. Hugo's head shook sadly. Perhaps not. You can see. I have tried everything. In itself, it is great. I can see that. It is, objectively, the most important thing on earth. But the other way, what can I do? Tell me that. You cannot tell me. I can destroy, as nothing that ever came before or will come again, I can destroy. But destruction, as I believe, as you believe, is at best only a step toward recreation. And what can I make afterwards? Think, think, man. Rack your brains. What? His hands clenched and unclenched. I can build great halls and palaces. Futile. I can make bridges. I can rip open mountains and take out the gold. I am that strong. It is as if my metabolism was atomic instead of molecular. But what of it? Stretch your imagination to its uttermost limits. And what can I do that is more than an affair of petty profit to myself? Mankind has already extended its senses and its muscles to their tenth powers. He can already command engines to do what I can do. It is not necessary that he become an engine himself. It is preposterous that he should think of it, even to transcend his engines. I defy you. I defy you with all my strength to think of what I can do to justify myself. The words had been wrung from Hugo. Perspiration trickled down his face. He bit his lips to check himself. The older man was grave. All your emotions, your reflections, your yearnings and passions come to that. And yet? Look at me in another light, Hugo went on. I've tried to give you an inkling of it. You were the first who saw what I could do, glimpsed a fraction of it, rather, and into whose face did not come fear, loathing, and even hate. Try to live with a sense of that. I can remember almost back to the cradle that same thing. First it was envy and jealousy, and then as I grew stronger it was fear, alarm, and the thing that comes from fear, hatred. That is another and perhaps a greater obstacle. If I found something to do, the whole universe would be against me. These little people, can you imagine what it is to be me and to look at people? A crowd at a ball game, a parade, can you? Great God, the scientist breathed, when I see them for what they are, and when they exert the tremendous bulk of their united detestation and denial against me, when I feel rage rising inside myself, can you conceive? That's enough. I don't want to try to think, none of that. I... Shall I walk to my grave afraid that I shall let go of myself, searching everywhere for something to absorb my energy? Shall I? No. The professor spoke with a firm concentration. Hugo arrested himself. Then what? Did it ever dawn on you that you had missed your purpose entirely? The words were like cold water to Hugo. He pulled himself together with a physical effort and replied, You mean that I have not guessed it so far? Precisely. It never occurred to me. Not that I missed it entirely. You have. Then for the love of God, what is it? Hardin smiled a gentle, wise smile. Easy there, I'll tell you. And listen well, Hugo, because tonight I feel inspired. The reason you have missed it is simple. You've tried to do everything single-handed. On the contrary, every kind of assistance I have enlisted has failed me utterly. Except one kind. Science? No. Your own kind, Hugo. The words did not convey their meaning for several seconds. And then Hugo gasped. You mean other men like me? Exactly. Other men like you, not one or two. Scores, hundreds, and women. All picked with the utmost care. Eugenic offspring. Cultivated and reared in secret by a society for the purpose. Not necessarily your children, but the children of the best parents. Perfect bodies, intellectual minds, your strength. Don't you see it, Hugo? You're not the reformer of the old world. You're the beginning of the new. 
We begin with a thousand of you, living by yourselves and multiplying. You produce your own arts and industries and ideals, the new titans, and then slowly you dominate the world, conquer and stamp out all these things to which you and I and all men of intelligence object. In the end, you are alone and supreme. Hugo groaned. To make a thousand men live my life? But they will not. Suppose you had been proud of your strength. Suppose you had not been compelled to keep it a secret. Suppose you could have found glorious uses for it from childhood. In the mountains, Hugo whispered, his eyes bemused, where the sun is warm and the days long, these children growing, even here in this place. So I thought, don't you see, Hugo? Yes, I see. At last. Thank God I do see. For a long time their thoughts ran wild, and when they cooled it was to formulate plans. A child taken here, another there, a city in the jungle. The jungle had harbored races before, not only these mayors, but the Incas, Kermers, and others. A modern city for dwellings, and these tremendous ruins would be the blocks for the nursery. They would teach them art and architecture and science, engineering, medicine, their own undiscovered medicine. The new titans, the sons of dawn, so ran their inspired imaginations. When the night was far advanced and the camp was wrapped in slumber, they made a truce with this divine fire. They shook each other's hands. Good night, Hugo, and tomorrow we'll go over the notes. I'll bring them. Till evening, then. Hugo lay on his bed, more ecstatic than he had ever been in his life. By and by he slept. And then, as if the ghosts of Octotal had risen, his mind was troubled by a host, a pageant of dreams. He turned in his sleep, rending his blankets. He moaned and mumbled, and when he woke, he understood that his soul had undergone another of its diametric inversions. The mad fancies of the night before had died, and memory could not rekindle them. Little dreads had goaded away their brightness. Conscience was bickering inside him. Humanity was content. It would hate his new race, and the new race, being itself human, might grow top-heavy with power. If his theory about the great builders of the past was true, then perhaps this incubus would explain why the past was no more. If his titans disagreed and made war on each other, surely that would end the earth. He quailed. Overcome by a desire to think more about this giant scheme, he avoided Hardin. In the siesta hour he went back to his tent and procured the books wherein his father had written The Second Secret of Life. He crammed them into his pocket and broke through the jungle. When he was beyond sight and sound, he dropped his machete and made his way as none but he could do. With his body he cut a swath toward the mountains, and emerged from the green vale on to the bare rocks, panting and hot. Upward he climbed, until he had gained the summit. To the west were strewn the frozen billows of the range, to the east a limitless sea of verdure, at his feet the ruins in neat miniature, like a model. Above scalding sun and blue sky, around him a wind strangely chill, and silence. He sat with his head on his hands, until his thoughts were disturbed. A humid breath had risen sluggishly from the jungle floor. The sun was dull. Looking toward the horizon, he could see a black cloud. For an instant he was frightened. The transformation had been so gigantic and so soundless. He knew a sudden urgent impulse to go back to the valley. He disobeyed it, and watched the coming of the storm. The first rapier of lightning through the bowels of the approaching cloud warned him again. Staunchly he stood. He had come there to think. I must go back and begin this work, he told himself. I have found a friend. The cloud was descending. Thunder ruminated in heaven's garret. It is folly, he repeated, folly, folly, folly in the face of God. And now the sun went out like an extinguished lamp, and the horizon crept closer. A curtain of torrential rain was lowered in the north. They will make the earth beautiful, he said, and ever and again. This thing is not beautiful. It is wrong. His agitation increased rapidly. The cloud was closing on the mountain like a huge hand. The muscles in his legs quivered. 
If there were only a god, he whispered, what a prayer I would make. And then the wind came like a visible thing, pushing its fingers over the vegetation below and whirling up the mountain, laden with dust. After the wind, the rain, heavy, roaring rain, that fell not in separate drops, but in thick streams. The lightning was incessant. It illuminated remote, white-topped peaks, which, in the fury of the storm, appeared to be swaying. It split clouds apart, and the hurricane healed the rents. All light went out. The world was wrapped in darkness. Hugo clutched his precious books in the remnants of his clothing and braced himself on the bare rock. His voice roared back into the storm the sounds it gave. He flung one hand upward. Now, God, O oh God, if there be a God, tell me, can I defy you? Can I defy the world? Is this your will? Or are you, like all mankind, impotent? O oh God! He put his hand to his mouth and called God like a name into the tumult above. Madness was upon him, and the bitter irony with which his blood ran black was within him. A bolt of lightning stabbed earthward. It struck Hugo, outlining him in fire. His hand slipped away from his mouth. His voice was quenched. He fell to the ground. After three days of frantic searching, Daniel Hardin came upon the incredible passage through the jungle and followed it to the mountain top. There he found the blackened body of Hugo Danner lying face down, his clothing was burned to ashes, and an accumulation of cinders was all that remained of the notebooks. After discovering that, Professor Hardin could not forbear to glance aloft at the sun and sky. His face was saddened and perplexed. We will carry him yonder to Uptotal and bury him, he said at last. Then the work will go on. End of chapter 23 and the end of Gladiator by Philip Wiley